It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, our sources are telling. My first uh, uh, question is for the Premier this morning, Speaker. Our sources are telling us that um, momentarily the government is going to announce uh, new limits on the number of people uh, allowed indoors uh, and outdoors in gatherings uh, in Toronto, Peel, and Ottawa. Uh, people will be asked to limit to limit their indoor gatherings to 10 people. My question to the Premier is, does this limit of 10 people in an indoor space include our classrooms in Ontario? Questions to the Premier. Well, to the Leader of the Opposition, I'm glad the, the rumours are half right, but uh, again, you'll stay tuned at 1 o'clock and we'll, we'll talk about that then. But our number one priority is to protect the people. Uh, right across this province, but especially protect the people in the outbreak areas that we've seen, be it Ottawa, Toronto, and, and Peel. And, Mr. Speaker, we always go to the advice of our chief medical officer and the other chief medical officers around the province, and most importantly, we listen to the mayors, because no one understands their communities better than the mayors. And when we have a request from the mayor, the local chief medical officer, and the Ontario chief medical officer, we listen and we follow uh, medical advice and science, and we're always going to continue following medical advice and science. So, thank you. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, for months uh, the Premier has been insisting that uh, having students crammed into classrooms by the by the by the dozens, up to 30 kids in a classroom, is perfectly safe. Now, in Ottawa, Peel, and Toronto, uh, the government's suggesting that that's not safe. That people need to be restricted to only 10 in an indoor space. Right. School buses, as the Premier also knows, are jam-packed with up to 70 kids in a small space. The Premier now saying, as I said, that it's unsafe to do so. How can he possibly then justify continuing to allow, in Peel, Ottawa, and Toronto, and other locations, 10, more than 10 children in a school classroom? Why is it okay to have 70 kids on a bus? and 30 kids in a classroom when he's saying that it's unsafe to have 10 people in an indoor space. Members will please take their seats. To reply for the government, the Minister of Education. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Just to provide some granular data on what we're doing in Ottawa and Peel and Toronto. Speaker, in Toronto District School Board, 366 more educators are being hired in real time because this government has allocated $200 million to ensure distancing in all schools in the province of Ontario. In Peel District School Board, on track to hire an additional 58 new educators, many more to come using federal, provincial, and reserve funding. And in Ottawa, in Ottawa Carleton, $33 million has been unlocked for that board to do more hiring, 45 more public health nurses in each and every community. We are taking a targeted approach, working with public health to limit the risk and increase the safety of all students in Ontario. Speaker. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, none of this makes much sense at all. The government's own experts have been very clear. It is impossible to practice safe social distancing when you have 20 or 30 students in a classroom. The Premier is now saying that a gathering of more than 10 indoors is a health risk, but he's still letting kids cram into crowded classrooms and crowded school buses. Later today, I have a, a motion to put a concrete cap on the number of students in every single classroom. My question to the Premier is, finally, will he do the right thing by our kids and cap the number of children in a classroom to prevent the COVID spread throughout not only our schools, but also our families and the rest of the community? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our plan has been informed by medical evidence and been endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health of this province. And, Speaker, what I can assure you is in the context of putting students first, that is exactly what the government is doing. We have put a four-week pause on any future expansion of social circles in the province. We have 
committed to expanding capacity of testing, getting up to 50,000. Speaker, we are taking further action to reduce the spread in those particular communities and in our schools. A 1.3 billion dollar allocation supported by the doubling of public health nurses, Order. more custodians, more educators, and more testing. Speaker, in every realm, we lead the nation, but we recognize we have to be responsive to the risk. Moms and dads that are depending on us to do that, and we will be there for our schools and for our parents. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. You know, over the last weeks, families have uh, had growing concerns about the increasing numbers of COVID-19 in our communities. They've been worried about the second wave at the very same time as they're ushering their children into schools with overcrowded classrooms, at the very same time as they're ushering their kids onto buses that are also jam-packed with 60 to 70 kids, at the same time as, they, as we know that they're worried about the spread that's starting to happen in long-term care once again. The lines for testing are growing longer and longer. You know, the Ford government promised some time ago that they had a detailed contingency plan in place for the second wave. That's what they called it, a detailed contingency plan. They promised that detailed contingency plan again this week. My question is, where the heck is it? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, I can assure the Leader of the of official opposition, as well as all of the people of Ontario, that we do have a very comprehensive fall preparedness plan to deal with a potential second wave of COVID-19, which is going to be released imminently. It's going to take into consideration the upcoming wave of COVID-19 in whatever form it's going to take, whether it's going to be a sharp peak or smaller peaks and valleys. We are preparing for the worst, and we are ready for it. We also have flu season approaching. We also have an increasing number of people coming into our hospitals because of the reductions we've needed to make in long-term care homes to reduce transmission in those homes. We also are trying to catch up on all of the surgeries and procedures that we had to postpone during the first wave. So the preparation for the second wave is more detailed and comprehensive than the first wave. We are ready for it and we will deal with it. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, maybe the government didn't realize that fall comes after summer. Yeah. Maybe they didn't realize that. I mean, it's ridiculous to say that they're prepared when we see the lineups that we're seeing right now for testing across the province. How would they not know that parents sending their kids back to school and people going back to work were going to want to see testing uh, to make sure that they're safe and that they can keep others safe? The hospital for sick uh, kids actually flagged this in their advice to the government months ago when, it, when they talked about the return to school plans. Yet it looks like the government, in this case, was caught entirely off guard, or maybe they just didn't care that people were going to want testing uh, and they didn't feel like it was necessary to actually put the testing in place. You know, if the government actually had a plan, we wouldn't see lineups stretching for kilometres uh, in many centres in our province. Order. If the government had a plan, to quote them, a detailed contingency plan, then why have we been so unprepared for September? Stop the clock. There's some audible noise emanating from the northeast corner of the legislature, the chamber. And I'm going to ask the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry to come to order, the Minister of Colleges and Universities to come to order, and the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks to come to order. Notwithstanding that you're wearing the mask, I can hear your voices and recognize them. Start the clock. To respond for the government, the Minister of Health. Speaker, and through you, Speaker, I can certainly advise the leader of the official opposition that we are prepared for the fall. We have already put many measures in place. We are already increasing capacity in our hospitals. We are already prepared for the flu season. We obtained additional numbers of flu vaccines, and we are prepared for COVID-19 increases. We have seen a 30 percent increase in demand for testing in the last three weeks, and in answer to the questions that have been posed by the members of the official opposition and by others in the last few days, I can advise that we have reacted immediately. We have increased in Peel. One assessment has increased capacity and hours, and four pop-ups 
are planned for the week of September 21st. In Toronto, two assessment centres have increased capacity in hours. We have one pop-up planned for the week of September 21st, with a 25% service increase by the end of September. Response? And in Ottawa, four assessment centres have increased capacity in hours, and three pop-ups are beginning to, to start operations tomorrow. So we are prepared. We are taking action. We can assure the people of Ontario that we are ready for any pop-up. Thank you very much. Thank you. The final supplementary. Thanks, Speaker. I have to say that the Minister of Health just identified the biggest problem with this Ford government. They are once again reacting to a crisis instead of preparing and ensuring that things were in place before the crisis is upon us. That is the problem here, and that has been the problem all along. And now what are we dealing with? Families who are stuck waiting in testing lines literally for hours putting kids on crowded school buses. The lack of readiness is, readiness is astounding. The fact that long-term care is once again experiencing outbreaks that are leading to the people uh, who live there losing their lives. This is not readiness, Speaker. This is react reaction to a crisis that's already upon us once again. This morning, the CBC reported that the public health uh, units don't know where people caught COVID-19 in 54 per cent of the cases. So that means, that means that contact tracing is also not up to snuff for the people of Ontario, Speaker. So the question for the minister and for the premier, frankly, question. is that although they claimed that there was a contingency plan in place, where the heck is it and when will we see it? Members will please take their seats. Premier to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I'm sitting across the aisle here and, and listening to the Leader of the Opposition go on and on and on as everyone has been working their back off. The Minister of Health has been around the clock, standing side by side with me for over five months. My question is, as the Leader of the Opposition Order. is missing in action for five months, nowhere to be found, nowhere to be heard, everyone Order. is cooperating across the country. No matter what political stripe you are, everyone's pitching in. And then we have the armchair quarterback over there pretending they have all the answers. You know, Mr. Speaker, I can assure the people of Ontario, we're using every single resource, we're using every single tool at our disposal to make life a lot easier. And when the Leader of the Opposition order. criticizes, it's not just criticizing us, Opposition it's criticizing the frontline health care workers, criticizing the doctors that helped put the plan together, the people in the grocery line that were checking people out as you were in hiding in your basement for the last five months. Thank you. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Davenport. Ah, well, uh, Mr. Speaker, good morning. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, at the start of this week, I pointed out that uh, large class sizes coupled with the rising COVID numbers across the province were putting a safe return to school in jeopardy. The minister has stood here uh, and refused again and again and again to admit that class sizes in many, most schools in this province are exactly the same size or even larger than they were before COVID. And just three days later, we have at least 41 cases in schools and our first school closure in Renfrew County. This afternoon, the minister and all PC MPPs will have a chance to do something about it when they debate, we all are going to debate here, the leader of the official opposition's motion to cap class sizes at a maximum of 15. We know now that your government thinks a gathering of more than 10 indoors is a health risk. Don't our kids matter? Don't our kids matter? Will the minister Question. join us in passing and implementing this motion today? Will the premier join us so we can ensure our children their families, our communities remain safe. Thank you very much. To respond, the Minister of Education. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, when we uh, developed the uh, plan to respond to COVID-19 for our schools, we did so listening to the public health advice every step of the way. What they have informed us throughout this pandemic, as the evidence continues to emerge on the issue of transmission for children, is that you need to have layers of prevention in place to mitigate risk. That is obviously the consensus position, the medical community endorsed by Dr. Khan and, uh, at SickKids as well. And the message has been heard, received loud and clear. We have introduced and measures to improve the environment by improving air quality, measures to improve the cleaning of schools and buses, an additional $100 million influx of funding to do just that in a one-time investment, doubling of public health nurses, changing to cohorting, staggering schools, and of course, taking action speaker uh, in the context of hiring more educators, more EAs, and more ECs. In every realm Response. we lead this nation, we are fully committed to the protection of our kids, and we will continue to be there to respond to the risk, including the influenza, where this government has dedicated $50 million set aside to respond to that challenge. The supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I mean, if the numbers that we're seeing every day is not a wake-up call for this government, I don't know what is. Every day this week, it's increased, and they may not like the fact that we're raising these questions, but it is our job, our responsibility as legislators to do that, to bring the voices of the parents and the children and the education workers into this space. Sorry it's so inconvenient. Speaker, on Monday, the minister claimed Order. school boards were hiring thousands of teachers and education workers. We hear it over and over. Order. But in a school board in the minister's own backyard, it's been reported that library workers are actually being laid off. With reports of empty classrooms, overcrowded, collapsed classrooms in the same schools, it is inconceivable that any education workers are being thrown out of work. Speaker, the minister has said the government will be responsive to the risk and take further Question. action. Will he do that today, support boards to hire and keep staff, and pass our motion to cap class sizes? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Education, once again, to the government has allocated $200 million to hire more educators in all boards in Ontario, in York, in Peel, in Dufferin, in Durham, and likewise in Toronto. We are seeing hundreds of new educators being hired. That is because Order. this government has provided boards the financial latitude, the funding they need to ensure these classrooms are safe. I will also take the opportunity, Speaker, to reaffirm the importance of adhering to public health advice. For staff members, when they are being asked to uh, be tested and stay home, we're encouraging them to do so. For students, likewise, to adhere to public health advice. We have a duty as a province collectively to respond to the advice of, of public health and, more importantly, to follow it to the T. And we encourage all staff, all students and all parents to continue to exercise heightened vigilance as we respond to this challenge. Speaker. The next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Over the past several months, our government worked hand-in-hand -hand with the Chief Medical Officer of Health and with the best medical experts. Our number one priority is the health and safety of our students, teachers, and staff. Public health units across the province have completed the hiring of over 500 additional nurses for our schools, and we are well on our way to hiring the full 625 positions. Schools are focused on hiring up to 1,300 cleaning staff and up to 2,600 additional teachers and education staff. We have put in $1.3 billion in critical supports, more than any other province in the country, for ventilation, staffing, PPE, cleaning supplies, mental health, and remote learning. Speaker, can the Premier please share with the legislature what further measures our government are undertaking as the school year resumes? Great question. Premier. Well, I want to thank the uh, great member from, from Brampton West. Thank you for that question. These are some of the tools that will help stop COVID right in its tracks. And we heard from parents, we heard from educators that they need more help identifying symptoms and managing uh, the cases. So, Mr. Speaker, we're, we're providing the supports uh, during COVID. As further due diligence measures, we announced yesterday a launch of the new interactive COVID-19 uh, screening uh, app for students, parents, and, and teachers. And my friends, it's free, it's voluntary, and it's easy to use. And now available on our website at ontario.ca slash COVID-19. I encourage the parents go on there and educators go on there. And it's an excellent, excellent tool to keep our kids safe, our educators safe, and it puts the parents uh, to ease a little bit. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. My supplemental question is to the Premier as well. 
Uh, Premier, I want to echo your sentiment as well. Uh, this new measure, along with our previously announced new online case tracker for our students and child care centers are important steps as we restart schools and ensure our children are kept safe. Our school reopening plan, supported by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, is comprehensive. It is nation-leading, fully funded, and evidence-informed. We have placed our students in cohorts, staggered re-entry to our schools. We have provided clear marking in schools to reduce contact. We have increased high and, uh, hand hygiene routines. We require screening before entering schools and ongoing work to improve air quality. Speaker, these are critical programs that our government has taken for this school year. Can the Premier share about further help our government is providing during this time? Again, the Premier. Well, again, th thank you to the member from Brampton. I first want to underscore the need for understanding and the patience for your, your workers and to, to parents. And so any employers out there, please have patience. If, you're, if one of your workers come in and their kids are sick, you be understanding. We're, we're going to get through this, and I, I just appreciate the employers out there working working uh, side by side with their, their great uh, team. We need parents to be able to pull their kids out of school any time if they're showing my, mild symptoms. Uh, we have the money set aside to respond for the flu season. And Mr. Speaker, it's almost like the, the perfect storm. We, we still have the lowest cases anywhere in North America uh, per capita, per 100,000 people. So everyone in Ontario, and I always say the government doesn't need the, the credit. We play the smallest part. It's the people out there. It's the frontline uh, folks, essential service people that are working day in and day out to keep our province uh, safe. And we're going to continue working across all political stripes, federally, municipally, and, and provincially, to make sure we get through this pandemic as safely as possible. And I just want to give a, a big thanks to the 14.5 million people Response. in this province for uh, supporting each other and their neighbours and friends and family members. Thank you. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. One of my constituents, Karen, has been going to St. Joe's for testing every two weeks so that she can visit her 97-year-old mother who lives in a retirement home. This week, however, she went to get her test and she had to wait almost two and a half hours in the cold, despite showing up before 8 a.m. Karen is over 70 years old and she said that she has felt the chill and cold ever since. Premier, it's only going to get colder, and the rate of increase of cases keeps growing. How many people are going to have to potentially put themselves at risk just because the Conservatives can't get a handle on testing? The Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker. Well, as I indicated, we have seen an increase in the request for testing, and we are preparing for that. In Toronto Region, to specifically address your concern, Women's College Hospital it has increased capacity and hours as of September 15th. Sunnybrook Hospital increased capacity and hours as, as of September 16th. Michael Guerin Hospital short-term pop-up testing as of September 17th. Humber Finch. Uh, increased capacity in hours September 21st. Mount Sinai, uh, increased capacity in hours the week of September 21st. UHN at Toronto Western, uh, short term pop up testing as of September 22nd. And Humber Church uh, Assessment Centre, a new location opening up September 28th. So we are responding to the request for increased testing, and we are preparing, of course, for colder weather because people are Response. able to be outside now, but that won't continue well into the future. So we are preparing for uh, future assessment centres and to make sure that people can be inside as the weather grows. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. And it's not just Karen who can't get quick and safe access to testing. Yesterday, the wait times at the local testing centre was four hours long with more than 100 people in line. Speaker, the government knew people were returning to work, schools were reopening, and that there was going to be an increased demand in testing. These resources should have already been in place. We warned the government that they weren't ready for a second wave. Local public health units, testing centers, have the capacity, they have the skills, they know what to do, what they need, and what they're asking for is more resources. So where, when is the Premier going to step up and provide the desperately needed resources to address testing before more people get infected. Minister of Health. 
Thank you. Well, I can certainly advise the member that we are prepared for an increase in the request for testing, and we are increasing our assessment centres, their times and hours, and increasing locations, pop-up locations, mobile testing units. We're also looking for other community partners that are going to be able to provide testing. This is in the works we are working on this. But of course, along with the testing centers, we also have to have the lab resources because you want to have a, a, a test that can be determined within a reasonable period of time, uh, not four days to a week. It needs to be done much faster for that, especially for people that are having their children tested for going back to school purposes or for going back to work. So we are increasing that. We have made significant strides since we first started with this. With wave one, we started off with just Public Health Ontario doing the lab testing. We now have a, a response that is coordinated with uh, uh, university and hospital labs, also with community labs that are also helping response. us in terms of the assessment centres. We've gone from just testing in a few centres to 148 centres. So we've increased with wave one. We are increasing with wave two as well to get up to 50,000 tests per day. We're already doing over 25 to 30,000 tests per day. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Speaker, we know the spread of COVID-19 is increasing in communities across Ontario, and it's rising in our long-term care, care homes, too. At Ottawa's West End Villa, 55 residents and staff have tested positive for COVID-19. Six residents have died. It's not the only home. Residents families, staff, and home operators are very concerned there's no plan for a second wave in Ontario's long-term care homes. Pandemic pay ended a month ago. There's been no move to raise the wages of PSWs. There's no promised increase in the standard of care. Donna Duncan, the head of Ontario's Long-Term Care Association, described the situation as terrifying. So, Speaker, through you, how is it the Premier, how is it, Premier, that residents in long-term care homes are finding themselves in the same spot they were last March. Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for the question. Uh, I want to make sure that everyone here knows that out of the 22 homes that are in outbreak right now, 15 have no resident cases, none. And our attention is focused on the homes that are suffering from having a community spread increase that is coming into the homes despite all our best efforts. Uh, we are looking at making sure that we are creating a robust, enhanced testing system, that all our homes have the necessary PPEs, that N95s are included in that equation, that our staff, uh, staff issues in our homes are being supported by hospitals, that we will continue to issue uh, mandatory management orders or volunteer management contracts as necessary, that we are engaging with our expert uh, health advice through the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Public Health Ontario, Ottawa Public Health. We will continue to do everything in our power to ensure the safety of residents and staff. Thank you very much. A supplementary question. Mr. Mr. Speaker, it's deja vu. Last March, while COVID was spreading, the Premier waited a month longer than British Columbia and Quebec to raise the wages of PSWs and to stop them from working in more than one home. And that decision caused needless suffering in Ontario's long-term care homes. And what it looks like to me is that there was a decision to wait for the federal government to give Ontario money, which other provinces didn't wait for. They took action. That delay came at a cost. And we find ourselves now in exactly the same spot, except for one thing. There are billions of dollars available in federal safe start funds and the Premier's own contingencies. So, Speaker, through you, can the Premier explain to families and staff why he's failed to prepare Ontario's long-term care homes for a second wave? And the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you for that important question. Uh, this has been an ongoing effort to shore up uh, uh, the staffing in our long-term care homes ever since we became a new ministry, and that demonstrates the, the commitment that this government has, a dedicated ministry to identify long-standing issues neglected by the previous government and supported by the opposition. And when Order. we look at 
at, at the Order. member opposite, who was the PA to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care Order. for many, many years. This is the reality that we are dealing for with. Ottawa, South come to order. We, understand, we understand the nature of the personal support worker issues, and I thank them from the bottom of my heart for the work that they do every day. From the bottom of my heart. And so order. we will continue to address the pay the nature of their work, integrate the care that they provide with career ladder. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. <laughs> Minister of Long-Term Care. When the speaker stands, the member has the floor will take their seat. The House will come to order. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. Question to the uh, Minister of Environment, Conservation and uh, Parks. The Great Lakes supply water to our communities, sustain traditional activities of Indigenous people, support Ontario's economy, and provide healthy ecosystems for recreation and tourism. North America's Great Lakes are important natural habitats for native species and support thousands of different uh, plants and animals. However, these lakes are facing pollutants, excess nutrients and invasive species. Our government is committed to restoring the Great Lakes for future generations. Can the minister share what our government is doing to protect and restore our Great Lakes? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks, thanks for uh, much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the uh, uh, neighboring MPP uh, from uh, Haldemar Norfolk, a long-time member of this legislature and a very strong conservationist in this, in this province. Uh, the Great Lakes are an important part of our province's economic prosperity and the well-being of our communities. Our government is committed to working with our partners and investing in on-the-ground projects that will improve the health of the Great Lakes so they are safe and beautiful for everybody to enjoy. We are funding approximately $5.8 million this year to support more than 65 projects run by local communities, academics, Indigenous communities, and various organizations across Ontario that focus on improving water quality. Supporting Great Lakes actions that protects and restores the Great Lakes are key commitments to our Made in Ontario Environment Plan. We are fulfilling the promise that we made to the people of Ontario to protect the Great Lakes, which are so vital to our natural heritage and to the unparalleled Response. quality of life that we enjoy in Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thanks, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his continued work to uh, protect Ontario's water. Not only do our Great Lakes attract millions of residents and visitors every year, they also provide safe drinking water for over 70 percent of the people in Ontario. Their watersheds support 4,000 species of fish, birds, and other living things. However, they are facing challenges such as uh, plastic pollution, salt pollution. We all know that uh, restoration, conservation, and protection are critical. Minister, what investments are you making to benefit the health of our Great Lakes and the ecosystems that they support? <coughs> Mr. The Environment, reply. Thanks again for that follow-up question, Mr. Speaker. We made a commitment to the people of Ontario and our Made in Ontario Environment Plan to work with our partners and take real actions to continue to protect the Great Lakes. Last summer, Ontario and the Canadian government released a draft of the new Canada-Ontario Agreement on Great Lakes water quality and ecosystem health. This agreement coordinates efforts to protect Great Lakes water quality. Building on those efforts, we are also investing up to $1.67 million for the new Great Lakes Local Action Fund. This will provide up to $50,000 for projects led by local groups to protect and restore coastal shoreline in near shore areas of the Great Lakes and the rivers and streams that feed into them. Mr. Speaker, supporting local actions that protect and restore the Great Lakes are key commitments in our Maiden of Ontario Environment Plan to ensure water resources and ecosystems are enjoyed now and into the future. The next question, the member for Waterloo. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Speaker, yet, during yesterday's question period, the Minister touted his listening skills. As a reminder, it's his job to not only listen, but also take action and listen to people like Michael Wood, the marketing director at Ottawa Special Events. He has been fighting for small businesses every day, including at our Finance Committee hearings this summer. In fact, he emailed each and every one of us earlier this week, and he wants action and deserves it including providing commercial rent relief directly to tenants on a sliding scale based on revenue loss and compelling insurance companies to honour business interruption insurance claims and provide liability coverage. In Michael's words, certain industries can pivot while others just cannot. Small businesses like Michael's and countless others are relying on this government to do more. Speaker, to the minister, What's next? Where's the plan? And when can businesses expect the support that they deserve? Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member um, and thank you to Michael for, for, uh, for that feedback. It gives me an opportunity to update the legislature on the progress of, of, the, of the rent relief that this government, in, in cooperation with the federal government, has provided, Mr. Speaker. And these are new numbers just, just today, so I'm pleased to share them. Mr. Speaker, over $296 million has been provided into support to 55,000 businesses in wow. Ontario alone. Mr. Speaker, that represents 544,792 employees that work for those businesses. That's the support that we've provided so far. Okay. Mr. Speaker, we are also in discussions, and I've spoken about this publicly with, with Minister Freeland, with the federal government, about a revision to that program. We believe that a better program can be put in place, and we provided those suggestions. Mr. Speaker, we have provided this support along with $10 billion of tax deferrals, Mr. Speaker, along with $355 million in tax reductions for employer health taxes. But, Mr. Speaker, we continue to listen. There are important issues Response. in front of us, and we will make sure that we listen, as this government always had, to the backbone of our economy, small business. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, pushing debt down the, down the road does not help businesses today. It doesn't keep them open. Speaker, and I'm tired of the talking points, and so are businesses. The province is staring down a serious economic crisis. People like Michael Wood and organizations like Save Small Business know this. That's why they fought so hard for small business relief programs. Save Small Business recently announced that they were done their advocacy. Here are some of their departing words. In the end, the policies we were advocating were delayed, watered down and overcomplicated. Speaker, the government should learn from those mistakes, not double down on failed policies. No one is buying what you are selling. They can't afford it. And businesses can only wait so long. Speaker, to the minister, when will this government come forward with a made in Ontario real plan for economic relief and stop relying on the federal government to do your job for you? Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, this government uh, continues to listen, and it's just like the opposition to belittle a program that's supporting 544,000 jobs in this province. Mr. Speaker, we will, we will never do that. In the, in the member's own riding, Mr. Speaker, last month, I had the chance to, to talk to Bogdan Frasina, who's a small business operator, who talked Order. about how this, this government's programs have supported what they are doing, supported their ability to build their business. And, Mr. Speaker, we are listening. And, Mr. Speaker, Order. In fact, I made the request in this legislature for all members of the legislature to provide us with ideas directly and I'm of course not surprised that dozens of my Member for uh, Waterloo will come to order. My colleagues on our side have provided that and I'd like to thank the three members of the opposition who provided uh, the uh, the member for Waterloo will come to order. The associate minister for energy will come to order. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services will come to order. Minister of Finance, conclude his response. So, just to conclude, my thanks of the three members of the opposition who provided input. From Muskego Walk, Jones Bay, the member did provide direct input. We appreciate that. From the riding of Sudbury, very much appreciated. And from the riding of Windsor, Tecumseh. And I'd ask the question um, of the rest of the members of the opposition why they didn't take the opportunity to provide that Spons. direct input into our November budget, which will support small business and which will make sure that we Order. continue to make this. A now we're going to stop the clock. Stop the clock. About two-thirds of the way through question period, we've got a ways to go. The House will come to order.
Let's restart the clock. Try again. Next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Not surprisingly, the numbers of COVID infections in Ontario are exploding. Just yesterday, the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, Aaron O'Toole, and his family were turned away from testing in Ottawa and got tested today in Gatineau, just as schools are reopening. We know the demand is there. A growing number of TDSB schools have confirmed positive cases in staff, and it is a matter of time before COVID spreads within schools, forcing classrooms and schools to self-isolate. This is why I received an inquiry from a concerned family who can no longer send their children to school in good faith, but are pre being prevented now from enrolling in virtual learning. If and when there is an outbreak, students need, will need to stay home from classrooms and continue with online learning. School boards are doing all they can with everything they've got, even draining their contingency funds. Mr. Speaker, Question. how is the minister going to ensure continuity of education while keeping our students and our communities safe? Minister of Education to reply. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Speaker, it was this government that in the spring when students were sent home, as the, the province sent students home uh, because, of the, uh, because of the pandemic, the first province in the country, it was this government that stood strongly in the defense of live synchronous learning for students. I do not recall a solitary opposition member who stood with parents to insist that the quality and continuity of learning continues during that period. Instead, they were absolutely silent. And that is unacceptable right. to parents of the province. Order. To parents of the province that want Order. to ensure that their child gets access to an educator. Order. That their child gets access to the curriculum. It is this government that it. Order. I'll ask the minister of education to wind up his response. Speaker, it is most regrettable when parents want their child to learn, have access to a teacher, and have a community with their students. We did not have unanimity of purpose in this legislature. There was silence by the members opposite. Today, our government set a 75 percent standard of live synchronous learning. We've mandated training for all educators. We will continue to expect the very best for all students in this province. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Well, Speaker, if we've been silent, you have been MIA because the boards, the federations, everyone have been asking, where are you and why isn't there an actual table to deal with the integration of schools? Mr. Speaker, enrollment in Order. Ontario schools classroom learning is down because the Minister of Education has not given families reason to be confident that schools will be safe. Some of the schools with the lowest enrollment are in my riding, and they are also in the poorest neighbourhoods in our city, where school nutrition programs provide invaluable food security to students. Mr. Speaker, there is a myriad of ways in which COVID-19 pandemic has exasperated inequality in our education system. For students who rely on these programs before, food security hasn't improved under the pandemic. In fact, it has gotten worse. Question. This government has spent a mere 1% of all of the COVID funding that has been provided federally and provincially on education and childcare. Minister, what is your plan to keep students on the margins safe and providing for the needs that Thank you very much. Minister of Education to reply. Well, thank you, Speaker. Obviously, from an equity lens, Speaker, we're very concerned about exacerbating any gaps within the classroom for our students, and that's why earlier in this process, uh, Minister Smith announced an additional million dollars for the student nutrition program to ensure the continuity of food programs within our schools. Speaker, in the context of higher risk communities in Scarborough and Etobicoke and other regions of Toronto, for example, the board working with public health and the ministry have imposed caps to reduce the number of children in those classrooms, 15 for kindergarten to three, and like and uh, 20 students capped from grade four to eight. There are uh, school boards right across the province utilizing provincial funding, hiring hundreds of teachers, in Toronto's case, redeploying hundreds of educators to the front lines. We are absolutely committed to working with all school boards. I met with the leadership of Scarborough General Hospital, along with my caucus colleagues from Scarborough, to speak about the synergies between education and, and our health care capacity to respond in the scenario of outbreak. In each and every area, in our investment speaker, we lead, and we recognize there's more to do, and we'll be there for our students and for our boards. Next question, the member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
My question is for the minister responsible for small business and red tape reduction. Minister, during this pandemic, thousands of small businesses across Ontario and in my riding of Mississauga Lakeshore had to close their doors to help stop the spread of COVID-19. Unfortunately, many small businesses were not equipped to deal with the loss of physical sales, as many businesses did not have the online presence. Can the minister tell the House what tools the government is providing to help small businesses go digital? The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Mississauga Lakeshore for that question. Uh, through the Digital Main Street program uh, announced uh, this past June, we are providing $57 million to help support uh, small businesses go digital. This is going to help approximately 22,900 businesses and create jobs for approximately 1,400 students. This is the single largest investment for businesses to go digital in the history of this country. About 60 per cent of small businesses have a website, but only 7 per cent uh, of businesses actually have an online payment solution. Digitally, Canadian businesses are two years behind their U.S. counterparts. This past May, we set a record, according to Statistics Canada, in e-commerce sales of over $3.9 billion. It is now more important than ever to make sure our businesses can pivot and move digitally to operate in new marketplaces and offer solutions to businesses across uh, and consumers Spons. across this province. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you very much, Minister, for all your hard work. Can you please update the House on how our government will continue to bridge the digital divide for underserved households in Ontario and extend new digital opportunities for rural and remote communities in Ontario? The Associate Minister. Uh, thank you for that uh, again. Uh, along with the Digital Main Street program, we were working hand-in-hand -hand to ensure uh, that businesses have reliable and accessible uh, internet, uh, especially in remote uh, areas. Along with uh, the Minister uh, of Infrastructure, who has released uh, significant plans, we know that fast and reliable internet will be critical to small businesses as they adjust to the new realities and the new marketplaces and how they will recover in the next phase. As many as 12 per cent of households in Ontario are underserved or unserved. We want to create greater opportunities for small business owners, and providing reliable and fast internet will help bridge this digital, digital divide in Ontario. The global marketplace is rapidly changing, and in order for Ontario businesses to compete, we need to ensure they have the tools. So this along with the $57 million investment into Digital Main Street, will ensure that our small businesses have the resources they require to ensure that they can compete in today's economy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. A few weeks ago, I held a virtual town hall with parents, trustees and experts about this government's back-to-school plan. During that town hall, Masita, a parent in Regent Park, shared her concern that this government is ignoring the advice of sick kids and health experts. Masita and other parents in our community are alarmed that their children are returning to class sizes of 27 or more, where it will be impossible to physically distance. Speaker, my riding is the most densely populated area in all of Canada, and we have some of the highest rates of poverty in the country. The risk factors for my communities is unbearably high. Masita is worried that without urgent action to cap class sizes for all schools, that the health and well-being of students, staff and our community could be severely at risk. Masita is asking this government to stop cutting in corners and invest in smaller class sizes. Will the Premier listen? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Indeed, the, pro the province is investing over $200 million to school boards in the province of Ontario to allow school boards to hire more educators. That is what is happening on the ground in every single school board in Ontario that's utilizing those dollars provided by government, in addition to the $496 million that the province unlocked in reserve funds by boards that could allow for an additional 5,000 more educators to be hired should they choose to use those dollars. And to be fair to boards, many of them have. We are absolutely committed to following public health advice on introducing multiple layers of prevention to mitigate the spread from hand hygiene, from distancing by 
hiring more educators, likewise better cleaning practices within our schools, enhanced testing as well, Speaker, uh, as a cohorting protocol that ensures we minimize the contact of students. We will continue Bonds. to follow public health advice, and as noted, Speaker, this plan has been fully endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of this province. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and respectfully back to the Minister, that's not what's happening in my community, and kids in my community in Toronto's downtown east are being left behind by your plan. <laughs> Parents and education workers are panicking. I've also heard from teachers, including Kara, who's unbelievably stressed by the current back-to-school scheme. She's working in jammed classrooms with 27 students with no more than 60 centimetres between desks. I've heard from parents who are outraged that the funding formula has forced schools to redistribute classes, resulting in class sizes of over 30 students. In some cases, those are larger class sizes than before the pandemic even started. Parents feel like this government simply do not care about the health of children, uh, and you don't care enough to fund a plan that's going to actually work and cap class sizes. Why won't the Premier release the funding needed to get smaller class sizes for a safe return to school? Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it was just yesterday that the TDSB Director of Education, Carlene Jackson, said that any school with larger class sizes will be given extra teachers to bring numbers down because the province of Ontario has provided them the financing and the support and the latitude to hire more educators and ultimately to reduce the risk. We are doing that in every school board in the province of Ontario. Dr. Khan also said that it's important to target those higher risk communities of transmission. That is precisely why we work with, for example, TDSB, Toronto Public Health, uh, Dr. Davila, and others to provide a plan that is very local, granular, and that reduces the amount of children in those classrooms from elementary to high school. We'll continue to follow the advice of public health and support our teachers, our frontline principals, and all students as they get back to school. The next question. Member for Burlington. Thanks so much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. The tragic death of any first responder is traumatic for their family and loved ones and can take a toll on the mental well-being of their co-workers. Occupational stress injuries can take a major toll on first responders as well. And when they take their own lives, we know how much more needs to be done. Back in March, I asked the Solicitor General about the government's independent review panel into workplace culture of the Ontario Provincial Police, as well as the number of tragic officer suicides among the force. When I asked, the Solicitor General indicated that a large majority of the recommendations have been implemented, but that more work needed to be done. Can she provide an update as to the status of these recommendations? The Solicitor General. Yes. Um, thank you. And the member from Burlington for this very important question. You know, she's absolutely right. Any time a uh, first responder takes their own life, it's a tragedy, which is why very on, early on in our government's mandate, we commissioned an independent review panel to help support the Ontario Provincial Police. When I last updated the House, I indicated that nearly two-thirds of the recommendations provided by the panel were already complete, near complete, or well underway. And I'm pleased to share that in response to recommendations, when it comes to the pressures faced by OPP officers in response to staff shortages, we were able to announce last month the hiring of 200 additional OPP officers. These new hires build on our government's investment in a new OPP psychologist and other mental health clinicians, part of a landmark $3.8 billion investment in mental health. We've also worked collaboratively Spons. with the OPP Association partners to launch an integrated mental health support program to assist the existing members. Thank you. Excellent. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I'm glad to hear that the government has been working to implement the recommendations of the independent review panel in support of the mental health and well-being of frontline officers. I'm also confident that this investment into the front line will make a difference when it comes to keeping communities safe. As Ontario continues the fight against COVID-19 in our communities, people across Burlington and Halton Region remain concerned about community safety. Speaker, during these challenging times, nobody deserves to live in fear of crime impacting their lives and livelihood. Can the Solicitor General share how the government's investment into frontline OPP officers builds on investment to protect the safety and security of people 
in Burlington and across Halton Region. Thank you. Thank you. Solicitor General. Thank you. You know, this, this work really isn't just being done in uh, silos with the OPP or with Solicitor General. It's, uh, it's pretty incredible and shows the commitment our government has that we have the very first minister responsible for mental health uh, announced by the Premier. It, it is an indication, frankly, of the commitment that we have as a government to make sure that we get this right, and we are steadfast in that commitment. I'm also pleased to share that the members riding in Burlington, of course, she would know the Halton Regional Police Service is receiving nearly $6 million in funding through both the Community Safety and Policing Grant and Proceeds of Crime Grant, which reinvests assets and uh, from seized criminals. These, this funding helps support the region's commitment to engaging the public and mobilizing community partnerships through a regional community mobilization bureau. This project supports community safety Bonds. across the region, including a local situation table that contributes to mental health crisis intervention and dedicated participation in the region's community safety and well-being planning process. These are just a couple of very specific examples, but it's happening across Ontario. Thank you. <laughs> Next question, a member for Thunder Bay, Atacopa. Thank you, Speaker. Alan Chambers, the chair of the Lakehead District School Board, wrote to the Minister of Education. Uh, the question is for the minister. We are fighting a virus, she wrote, we are fighting a virus 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt with an empty wallet. You have responded to the need for more funds by unlocking funds from school board's reserves. While this sounds great in a soundbite, the reality of boards is far more difficult. The Lakehead Board requested the provincial government fully fund ventilation updates, health and safety equipment, and proper physical distancing in classroom and buses. Premier, when, um, Premier, Minister, when will this government finally decide to fund a safe start to school? Good question. Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. I know there's uh, many school boards that she will represent in Thunder Bay, for example. For the district school board, they have an additional $4.7 million has been provided for them to hire more educators and ultimately just to ensure the greatest uh, learning experience, the safest experience for their kids. There's also eight more public health nurses. We've doubled that capacity. We've invested in internet expansion because we realize in remote and northern parts of the province that they continue to have a gap working with the Minister of Infrastructure to ensure that more communities, more schools are uh, connected to the internet, which will be very important for remote learning and for all learning in the province of Ontario. We provide an additional $51,000 to buy over 103 more devices, an additional $400,000 specifically for remote learning for that school board to enhance their capacity to reach as many students as possible as we get through this challenge, Speaker. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Raymond, uh, thank you, Speaker, and Minister, thank you for that response. Raymond Roy, chair of the Rainy River District School Board, also wrote the Minister of Education. Mr. Roy acknowledges the $302,000 they had received, but state, stated it fell short of the $1.9 million needed for a safe start to remote schools, and the $188,000 available from their reserve was not enough. He concluded in his letter, the, the extraordinary costs associated with safely reopening schools should be covered by the province in order to respond to the unprecedented challenges of COVID-19. What is the government waiting for? Mr. Vegetation. Well, Speaker, we provided $4.7 million more to the Lakehead District School Board, enabling them to hire uh, more than uh, more educators, $580,000 more for education staff, $500,000 for other priorities to respond to COVID, including $200,000 to hire more custodians in this particular board, an additional $200,000 for mental health staff and, of course, special education receiving an additional 83000 Speaker, what we're doing for that board and for those students is what we're doing for all students in the province, providing more resources, more staffing, and ultimately more capacity to respond to the challenge of COVID-19. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And speaker, through you, I want to thank those that gave me that tremendous ovation. It's great to be back. 
Anyway, uh, Mr. Speaker, my uh, question is to the Associate Minister of Transportation. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit municipalities hard, and it is especially taking its toll on municipal transit agencies here in the province of Ontario and across Canada. As people stayed home, that meant they weren't riding local buses, and ridership declined accordingly. Although ridership is going up as the province gradually and cautiously reopens, many municipal transit agencies will need help in order to make sure that they can keep buses running for those who need them. Speaker, my question to the minister, what is the province doing to ensure transit remains a safe and reliable option for commuters in Perth, Wellington and across Ontario? The Associate Minister of Transportation, TPA. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you very much to the very hardworking member from Perth, Wellington. Since the early days of the pandemic, we have been talking with our municipal partners about how, be how uh, could we best support them. Earlier in the summer, we released our provincial transit guidance document that outlined best practices for transit agencies, operators, as well as passengers. Later, we allocated $15 million to transit agencies th through the province's transit cleaning fund to help with the added cost of enhanced cleaning. We supported our Premier, who negotiated our Safe Restart Agreement with the federal government, which will provide up to $2 billion to support uh, municipal transit agencies to reduce their budgetary pressures. Mr. Speaker, we are working all together to make sure we keep transit safe for all Ontarians. Thank you. The supplementary. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for that great answer. I was grateful to see that $7.5 million of that $2 billion was allocated to uh, 11 different agencies in municipalities across Perth Wellington through the Safe Restart Agreement that you just mentioned. Whether it was the City of Stratford, who received over $487,000, or the Municipality of West Perth, who received over $16,000, Transit agencies across my riding were certainly relieved to see that some relief is on the way. Speaker, can the minister please tell us when the municipalities can expect to receive the money and if this $7.5 million that is being provided will be enough for municipalities in Perth, Wellington? Associate Minister. Thank you very much. And through you, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that transit agencies are seeing lower ridership and additional costs associated with enhanced cleaning. This funding is just the first step. We're working very hard right now at the ministry to sign agreements with each individual municipality so that we can get them the relief they, they need as soon as possible. At the end of the fiscal year, we're going to have another phase of funding that will go out after they have provided us with additional information on their estimated COVID-19 financial pressures. Mr. Speaker, we want to make sure that whether you're taking transit right here in Toronto or in Stratford, that it is safe and reliable. Next question, the member from Meshkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier, last Monday, the in the uh, school board in my constituency said that they could uh, close classrooms for one day because there's no replacement teachers. So if a teacher gets ill or if a teacher's kids has a runny nose, tens of kids won't be able to go to school and parents will have to stay out of work. However, the Minister of Education has told us again and again that school boards were able to hire more staff. I believe he forgot francophone school boards, especially in northern Ontario. What can you tell people in the north, to parents, students, who will probably miss school days because there won't be any teachers? Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. We are uh, very much aware of a long-standing shortage of French teachers in this country. We've been working very closely with the Minister of Francophone Affairs, as well with a variety of Francophone partners in the province to ensure that we have access to uh, French educators, working with the Ontario College of Teachers, as well as with faculties of education, and likewise 
with the French Consul General to see how we could further support immigration of French-speaking educators in the province of Ontario. In the context of uh, access to uh, supply teachers, we've ensured that every teacher, likewise an occasional teacher in the province of Ontario, has undergone vigorous health and safety uh, training. We've provided $10 million to do that. We're the only province to do that ahead of the school year speaker. We'll continue to work closely with that school board. We're providing a variety of the French schools boards in the, in the north with new resources to do more hiring and likewise to ensure that those students get access to a positive education through COVID-19. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning and for this week. Beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 101C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Mr. Cramp assumes ballot item number 19 and Mr. Babikian assumes ballot item number 62. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Long-Term Care concerning the second wave of COVID-19. This matter will be debated Tuesday at 6 p.m. Government House Leader has informed me that he has a point of order he'd like to raise. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Standing Order 59, I would like to announce the business for the next week. Uh, Bill 182, an act to amend the Franco-Ontario Emblem Act, standing in the name of uh, Ms. Kusadnova from Mississauga Centre. Government Notice of Motion Number 88. Government Notice of Motion Number 89. Bill 202, the Soldiers' Aid Commission, standing in the name of Minister Smith. Uh, Bill 131, Tibetan Heritage Month, standing in the name of uh, uh, Butila Karpocha from uh, Parkdale High Park, and a bill that will be introduced later this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.